courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's been an interesting week back home for the Flames, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to talk about, I guess, what could probably be called the biggest home slump this franchise has ever been in. Matt, what do you think about what's going on for the Flames at home right now? Well, the Flames' home problems, it's, it reminds me of that year that uh, Playfair was the coach back in 05-06, where they were just... It, I think in that year they were stellar at on the road and not at home at all. And I don't know. It's just so random that they're so terrible at the Saddle Dome and yet are so good everywhere else. It's so difficult because I don't know why they're so bad at home. It doesn't even make any sense because of the fact that they're they they seem to make mistakes that don't even make any sense really and it's frustrating as a fan to see them waffle so much like that pass for example in overtime with TJ Brody like if he threaded the needle there and it got to Gaudreau that probably is a goal but Monaghan was wide open on the other side and there was nobody covering him and there was no need to make the risky play there but the sense i'm getting from this team is i think they're trying to play too fancy they're trying to really appease the sea of red when they're at home and when they're on the road it's a much simpler game and they play more reactionary hockey they have to react to you know whatever line the home team puts out and i think maybe they're overthinking the game when they're in the dome yeah, it reminds me of back when Curtis Glencross used to, like, the couple of times that he had to take penalty shots, and he just couldn't handle the time and space to be creative there, and those penalty shots were terrible. And with him, he was a very instinctual player, and if it wasn't just flowing naturally, and if he was trying to be more than he was, he'd struggle. And I think the Flames themselves are having that exact same problem where at home they're trying to do things, be the exciting electric brand of hockey that they do have in them, and it's getting in their way of even just the basics of winning games. And at this point, who cares about being fancy? Just get the puck in the net. Well, I was noticing a lot in the Florida game, and especially the Buffalo game, or sorry, Boston game, um, Calgary trying to make one too many passes or one too many long passes. And yeah, I think they're just trying to look fancy and it's like, you know, just play the hockey. Yeah. And realistically, their team is deep enough where they shouldn't be in a fight for a playoff spot. They should be comfortably ahead. Not too much so, but enough where if they lost four or five in a row, it wouldn't really make that much of a difference. But instead, every game it's live or die and that's not the situation that i think either one of us expected them to be in at this point there's only 22 games left on the schedule and they have to win about 14 of them well let's look back at the last four that they played kind of a disappointing week for the flames and they only got three of the possible points well Uh, you have to also figure that uh, they're playing three of the elite teams in the league in yeah, but at this the same week. Time, if, so. they, if they think they're a playoff team, you've got to be able to compete against those guys. And they, they did get three points in those games. So it, it could have been better, but the backbreaker was the Florida game. Well, we'll get there. Let's start with the away game in Boston. So the Flames rolled into Boston to play one of the hottest teams in the league and ended up falling 5-2 to two in this game. I like the Bennett goal in this one. That was about all I liked of the Flames. Yeah, they were holding their own, and the other team just simply outplayed them and out-talented them and just wore the Flames down until they collected the two points. The thing I noticed in this game and the home game with with Boston is just how fast they are. Not just how quickly they move around the ice, but you'd see a Flames player get the puck and take a second to decide what he wanted to do with it. And by the time he'd done that, someone was already right there attacking him for it. And I think that that's a big part of Boston's success. They're just very quick. Yeah, and 
that their system is very good and they have a lot of very exceptionally talented players and frankly i think that boston is the front runner to come out of the east right now just based on the, their overall makeup so it's not surprising that they're a real pain to play against and they earned the two points quite easily Thursday night, the Calgary Flames went into Nashville and they beat. They ended Nashville's regulation run of 10-0-1 in a 4-3 win. Not a huge win here. What did you think about this game? I thought Riddick played well. I, I think that other than that one goal that he just surrendered randomly in the third period, I think he was the difference maker and he had one of his better games as a Flame. And if it wasn't for him, I don't think the Flames get two points. Uh, they could have been a little better, but they were going against the Western Conference champions and went punch for punch with them and ended up winning. So uh, I don't have much to complain about from this one. I was excited to see the depth scoring here. We saw a goal from Janko. We Definitely. saw a goal from Lazar. Hamilton got on the board. I was hoping that was going to open the floodgates for something to happen later in the week. Yeah, same here. And it's one of those things that, like with Curtis Lazar, he got one goal. And sometimes when you're in a snide like he was, that's all you need just to get that monkey off your back. It relieves the pressure, and then you can just go out and do your thing. And we've seen since then that he's had his best stretch as a flame. And I think that there's more to Lazar than what he's been given thus far. And hopefully he starts rounding out his game where he can be looked upon as a dependable third, fourth line forward. Hopefully he makes it worth our second round pick. Well, if he plays in the NHL for a handful of years, I, I think that'd be worth it. Then the Calgary Flames came home after their long two-week road trip, and on Saturday they played against your second favorite team, the Florida Panthers. We saw Luongo come back from his injury, his first start since December 4th in this one, and I guess it, it, was, a, it was supposed to be a fun game. It was Riddick's first game as a flame starting in the dome and i guess the best thing to say is this one quickly got away from the flames it it was one of those where the puck dropped and everything went wrong (laughs) and there you have games like this and it this was the game that i think that we were both counting on them getting two points and they should have got the two points but Bad things happen, and the goalies, both of them struggled a bit. There's not much you can do. It, it, bad games happen. Goalie, especially non-elite starters like Mike Smith, do have bad games. Even Mike Smith has bad games, but not as frequently. It happens. It was Riddick's first bad start as a Flame. Not a big deal. It's frustrating because the Flames are in a situation where they need every point, but that's going to happen to us it's going to happen to san jose it's going to happen to anaheim it's going to happen to la so it just it's frustrating it sucks but there's not much you can do i wasn't sure what to expect coming to this one with the flames coming off the long road trip as you know sometimes they stall or don't do as well in that first game i was really impressed though with the first period i thought the flames were the better team in the first And then I think what happened is they just started paying for their dumb penalties. I mean, the first two goals of the second period from the Panthers, the Trocek and the Dadanov goal were both power play goals. And I think that's where this game started slipping away from the flames. They did what we often see. They get frustrated and they just start playing and just And I think that what we're seeing uh, and what Brian Elliott last year, he called the team schizophrenic. And I think that that's what you're seeing from this team is that uh, unlike other teams that should be elite teams, I do not think that the Flames have the mental maturity to be a winning hockey team as of right now. And that's frustrating to say, but like you're seeing like one thing goes wrong, like say with Sam Bennett, one thing goes wrong and then his entire game screwed over and he's just terrible from that point on and there's a whole bunch of different flames players that are like that and until the flames can sort out why these mistakes are happening this perpetual 
underperforming their abilities is going to happen. So we should bring in Dr. Phil. Pretty much. <laughs> Um, before we move away from the Florida game, big props to Dougie Hamilton. Got his first career hat trick, his 11th, 12th, and 13th of the season. And his uh, the first hat trick from a defenseman, I believe, since 1992. Didn't Dion have one? So it's been a while. Uh, I think he had Ready? one uh, sure. his last game as a flame. Yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and check. But, but it, it's too bad. It was a waste of a good hat trick. Yeah, well, it happens. And it's unfortunate, but it, this team it, it can't seem to get out of its own way. And then we had the game on Monday, the matinee game for Family Day. The Boston Bruins this time came to Calgary to take on the Calgary Flames. And this game is notable because it was Morgan Klimchuk's NHL debut. He's now the last first-round pick from his draft class to play in the NHL. He played on the fourth line with Lazar and Stajan. And this was a... An interesting game, I'd say. The Flames end up dropping it two to one in overtime, but I I don't know. There's ups and there's downs. What were your well, thoughts? Well, I thought Klimchuk had a good game. I think he was solid enough. Where if you had to throw him in the NHL for an extended period of time, I don't see there being a major problem with that. I don't think he's gonna ever be more than a depth forward on the team, but he, he's getting to the point where he's figuring out how to play at the nhl level at least and we'll see if there's more to him or not it only time will tell and he got reassigned back to stockton the flames i thought it unlike the first boston game i thought for large stretches that the flames were the better team in this game and i think that rask was the difference and i think that was very important for david riddick to get the start in that game just due to the fact that he was pulled for the first time in his career so to, for him to have a bounce back effort like he showed showed a lot about his character and resiliency and that he's not gonna get unnerved just because he had one bad start and he can just be thrown back in there and be perfectly fine. And I, he was the reason why the Flames got a point in this game. And it's good. Uh, I wish that people other than Kachuk were getting goals, but sometimes the first line gets you need cold a, and the Flames tend to lose. You need a great goaltending effort to even get one point from a team like Boston, and that's what we saw here. Riddish definitely looked great. Um, as you mentioned, I thought Klimchuk looked good. I actually talked to Coach Gullitson after the game about Morgan Klimchuk and some of his thoughts. Why don't we cut to those right now? Your thoughts on Morgan Klimchuk and his debut tonight? I thought he gave us some good energy. I thought he skated well. He certainly can skate. Um, he's certainly good positionally. He knows the game. You can tell there's good hockey IQ there. Um, I think a good one for him is uh, he, uh, to play games in the National Hockey League, realize how heavy. Uh, the games can be so uh, I think that's that's you know, something you'll take out of the game but uh, I thought that line was effective for us so as you can hear the coach was pretty excited about him or I wouldn't say excited maybe but thought he was a good hand I think anytime the coach says those kind of things about a player he'll probably get another look um, just going through my notes here <coughs> I was really disappointed by the Flames getting only five shots in the first um, you, you can't be getting that few shots and hope to win a hockey game I was surprised Tuka Rast didn't come out for the second period in a onesie after having fallen asleep. Well, it is coming, what it is. Coming into the second, I was saying whoever gets the next goal is probably going to win. I thought if Boston scored before Calgary, it would have been, um, you know, Calgary's lights out here. I also had in my notes that I thought Stajan played a really terrible second. He got a bad penalty. He just wasn't playing well here, and it's... It's tough for a guy like Klimchuk and Lazar who are trying to do the right things when you've got a veteran who's not. Um, and I thought the Flames finally showed up in the last five minutes of the second, played right through the third. And you mentioned earlier in the show, I talked to TJ Brody after the game in the dressing room. He was pretty much owning that screw-up in the o overtime. He said it was all his fault. And it's, it's just one of those lapses in judgment that we see way too many times in the Saddle Dome. He should have just passes up the board to somebody else you don't give it right out front of your net to a boston player yeah well especially when monahan was open right on the right side 
and there was no Boston player over there. So it is what it is. It happens. It sucks. It's horrible. But that's life, and hopefully the mistakes get turned down a bit instead of continuing at pace. And if we have to give up two points, somebody would rather it's an Eastern Conference team than a Western Conference yeah. team. Yeah, and like frankly, with the three games, the pair against Boston and the one against Nashville, getting three points in the three games, perfectly fine by me. You know, it, the Flames only heading into this week only have seven games against the top ten teams in the league, so three of them are out in the books already. We got three points. That's fine. It, now the rest of the vast majority of the rest of the games are against the middle and weaker teams in the league and the flames have to start picking up points against them and that's why the panthers game was a huge disappointment but again that things like that happen so the flames currently sit at 69 points tied with la just outside that wild card spot held by minnesota at 71 points and st louis at 72 Matt, based on where the team is right now, based on what we're seeing from them at home, what's your confidence right now in this team making the playoffs? If they do not get a scoring forward of some form, I am leaning more towards them missing the playoffs. Because that's the main problem that the team has right now. Defensively, they're fine. It's just that if Gaudreau's line's not going, or Kachuk's not going the team's not going anywhere and the flames only have those four options the first line and kachuk and they need another person that can throw a goal in the net and at this point everybody else is too inconsistent players like jankowski and bennett disappear for too long the fourth line's non-existent they need help and right now they're not getting it and unfortunately it that could be enough to screw the team out of a playoff spot just because of the fact that they're not getting any consistency with the offense defensively they're fine like i don't uh, there's not really much more that you can ask from the team they're doing a good job at preventing goals it's just getting them is the main obstacle well, and I think we all knew that. I mean, coming into this season, we'd said that, you know, the Flames had the best blue line in the league. Yeah, and I think that... The question with ver- was the scoring forwards. So I think we're seeing that... We're seeing the prophecy on paper fulfilled. Yeah, and with Versteeg and Yager, who are both expected to kind of ease some of that pressure not being here, uh, that's the main problem. And... It, they were relying on the pair of them to contribute at least a little bit and neither one of them did and that's part of the main issue right now thankfully Versteeg will be back Yager who knows but it, the Flames could use another second line-ish scorer a guy like a Nyquist the Hoffman a Zuccarello there's a whole bunch of different insert name of guys who can put up 50 points plus it, they need one and if that costs one of the defensemen so be it so you're thinking that without that this team doesn't make the playoffs yeah they, uh, they need it in the most desperate way and with rasmus anderson and oliver shillington both playing extremely well for stockton you're going to see a hit on the defense core if you trade any of them but the step down is less impactful than it could be because of the fact that you have two guys that are basically at Jankowski's level when he was ready to push into the league, but on the defense course. So it, both those guys could step in right now and play. They just don't have a roster spot. So if the Flames were to make a deal, it could work that... It, the Flames would be fine with the, one of the kids in the NHL. I think right now, if the Flames were not so close to teams like LA in the standings, I'd be a lot more confident. I think right now, the Flames' destiny this season is not in their own hands. A lot of it's going to be in the hands of the teams around us, like Anaheim, like um, even Colorado, LA. So I think right now, knowing that, and teams that are doing better than maybe they should have, like an L.A. or a Colorado, I'm a little bit nervous about the Flames' chances. I also think, and Matt, tell me what you think, 
if we do make the playoffs, I'm not convinced with how the teams are playing at home. This team can win four of seven or let's say one of two in the dome, which they would have to do. Well, that's the thing. Now with parity being pretty much ubiquitous, all the teams that make the playoffs are good teams. And like we saw that last year with Nashville making the finals as the eighth seed. L.A. making the finals and winning the cup a few years ago as the eighth seed. There's not really any huge golf where before it was like you'd get like the team like the Minnesota North Stars that one year when they made the finals in 91 where like they were a horrible hockey team that just kind of fluked out their way to a finals appearance and you're not seeing that now like at- but even then not seeing any scoring from anyone but the first line and Kachuk I don't think you can win four games with that no, and that's why the Flames need to make a trade. And if they don't, then I don't even think they make the playoffs in the first place. And if they don't, I, and they do make the playoffs, it, it's going to be like a five or six game series. Well, let's talk about the trades then. We're a week out. It's the 20th of February as we record this. Trade deadline day is next Monday, February 26th. And a lot of talk going around the league right now about potential deals. We've talked about a few deals in the past. Um, Matt, it sounds like we both agree that the Flames need to really make a deal, I think, if they're going to make a deal for uh, scoring forward. A couple questions I have for though for you, though. Do you think that the Flames will make a deal at the deadline, try and recoup some draft picks? If we make the playoffs, we don't pick till the fourth round. Do you think that will be front and center on Trill Living's mind, or do you think that's more of a draft day deal if he's going to do it? Oh, uh, realistically the only uh trades that i could see to recoup picks would be like say trading poirier or klimchuk or shin carrick for a mid to late round pick if some team's interested beyond that i don't really see the flames making any deals to recoup any picks in terms of veteran players because i I don't really see anybody on the nhl roster that's expendable and you actually get something for um matt stage you, you might the, be able to get like a seventh round pick for if somebody is desperate yeah, for a veteran center that's not really recouping a good pick though you don't go well we have no second let's get a seventh yeah i think that in order what the flames will try to do to recoup some of the bodies that they were going to get from the draft is sign some European free agents or NCAA free agents. European or college, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the way they're going to go about it. I mean, they've already got Glenn Godden signed, who they really like, so that's one you know Canadian junior player who was an unrestricted free agent. Yeah, and I think that they'll do continue to do that some more to try and get some more players in the line up anyway for Stockton. Do you think the Flames do you think the Flames will make their big deal at the deadline or at the entry draft? Well, I think that as bad as it sounds, in order to make sure that his hand will still be in the pie for running the ship, I think that Treliving will have to make a deal at the trade deadline instead of at the draft just due to the fact that if he and the flames miss the playoffs i don't know as if he has a job at the end of the season and uh, fairly or unfairly because the flames should be an elite team and they're not so like if they miss the playoffs entirely especially with giving up a first round pick like yeah that's they need to do something to make sure that at least cross the finish line in the postseason. So, Matt, I put together a set of names here, some guys I think are maybe reasonable targets for the Flames. Let's go through them. I'll tell you why I think each guy. Give me your thoughts, and then if you've got anyone you want to throw in there, we can do that. How does that sound for you? Definitely. So I was looking at the teams that are out, and, I mean, mostly I'm looking at, I think, Eastern teams. I think there's going to be more... Buy more sellers in the East, and I don't see Calgary trading with Edmonton. I don't see Calgary trading with Vancouver. I don't see there being a lot that we want in Arizona. So I said, you know what? Let's start in New York. The Rangers seem to be selling. One guy that I really like there, he's a little bit older, but on a great cap hit, is Michael Grabner. 
Uh, Grabner can play right wing. He's 30. I believe he's making $1.65 million on his last year. The Flames need some veteran help, especially with guys like, um, you know, Versteeg going down and Yager going down. And this is the kind of guy who I could see being more than a rental. I could see him re-sign him next year for about $2 million. I, I've always liked Grabner as a player. I think he could fit in well here, not as your maybe top line right winger, but as a depth right winger. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I I think that would be like a secondary deal, but if the, you can get him for a couple of decent prospects, it, uh, like I'm saying, like equivalent of a third round pick. Or yeah, well, and that's the other ish. thing is with New York trying to rebuild, I can see you being able to pick him up without giving up a roster player. Yeah. Um, Whatever another, the equivalent of a third is, maybe like a fifth on top of that, and there you go. Yeah, I could see it being something like Hunter Shin Carrick and a uh, conditional pick or something like that. Yeah, or Klimchuk or Poirier or whatever. Insert miscellaneous guy like that. Another guy I have on my list, a guy a little bit younger, bigger cap hit. Um, I think in order to get him, you'd probably need to find a way to move Brower out, but... Um, from Detroit, I'm thinking Thomas Tatar. He can play both wings. He's 27. He's making $5.3 million on a three-year deal. Again, this is a guy I could see potentially fitting in well in the Flames lineup and potentially being a better fit on that first line than Furland. I'm actually going to... Same team, but I'm going to go a different direction, and that's with Gustav Nyquist because of the fact that he's a, more of a shooter than uh, Tatar, and I think that he's more of the type of smart player that the flames would need. And I think you could slot him on any of the top three lines. Really? See, it, I see it, Nyquist being high in demand and I'm not sure I'd want to play in a bidding war for him. True. I think there's going to be a lot of teams that want Nyquist and I don't think whoever gets him, I don't think it'll be worth whatever price is paid. And that could very well be. Um, the next guy I had, I talked to you a couple weeks ago about the idea of bringing Patrick Sharp in as a veteran. I'm kind of going away from that now. He's old, he's slow. I think if if we didn't have Versteeg coming back, I'd be more excited about potentially bringing uh, Sharp in. But a guy I do like, he plays center right now. He's a right shot in Chicago. Really good contract, less than a million, is Tommy Wingles. I think Wingles could be a guy you could put on that third line. Um, he's 29. He's got one year left. I think you could probably acquire Wingles for pretty cheap and might be a good depth forward for this team. Yeah, if you get him for a six-round pick or equivalent, sure, why not? And now we'll move into some of the bigger names I've got. Um, I'm going to go with a... Realistically... I'm going to go with a weird one uh, for you. and um, Sure, from Chicago? No, uh, actually from Ottawa. Now, okay. here's a interesting scenario. Say you want to get Eric Carlson, like we discussed previously. Would you take Bobby Ryan's contract if you included Troy Brower in the deal? Well, that's what the guys on TSN are talking about now is... Yeah, I mean, the guys on TSN are saying that in order to get uh, Erickson, you'll probably have to take Ryan. I just don't see... Ottawa's trying to shed salary. I don't see how you convince them to give you bad salary to get Well, bad Ryan salary. makes a lot more money than Brower, though. So, you know, like. It, for sure. But if they're just trying to cut cost. Well, it's a, a lot cheaper for them to go with Brower, and Ryan only has 20 points this season. So. Ryan's got, what, four years left? Something like that, three or four. I don't think I would do it simply because I think bringing in that much salary would limit us when it comes to re-signing out of Kachuk. Yeah. Um, I, especially with, and we'll talk about it a bit later, especially now knowing what Backlund's making, I think that if you bring in a big deal like the Ryan deal, you, you're you going to take on way too much. I still don't believe that we need... I mean, it'd be fun to bring in a big defenseman like Carlson, but I still don't think the Flames need to give up what it would take to do that. No. I don't think this team gets marketably better by bringing in Carlson. 
All right, so the next name I have, I don't see Pacaretti coming here. I think, again, no. the bidding war is going to be high for this guy, and I really don't want to pay whatever crazy price he's going to Yeah, take. and plus he's a very inconsistent and somewhat lazy player, so I don't think we really need to add another one of that type of player when the Flames kind of have a little bit of problems with too many of that type of player. What would you think, though, from Montreal if we brought in 25-year-old winger Brendan Gallagher? He, perfect. Awesome. Uh, Three point seven five million for four years. He's got a decent cap. Yeah, it would cost you an arm and a leg, but boy, he'd fit in with Kachuk. God, the, that would just be fun. <laughs> That's one of those pieces that might be worth, you know, moving a guy like a Brody to get Gallagher in here. Yeah. Um, another one that we've talked about in the past. Another twenty-five-year-old. Um, from Ottawa, we were talking about them earlier. It's Mark Stone. He's on a one-year deal, three point five million. Would you rather have Stone or Gallagher if you could only have one? I'd have Gallagher. Oddly enough, and the reason for that, Stone's obviously a better player, but Gallagher, he's a pain in the ass, and that that's more important, especially in the postseason. And he's well, a right shooting right winger, so you could, if you had a line of Kachuk, Backlund, and Gallagher, that'd be fun. <laughs> Stone's also going to be a UFA at the end of the year, and the Flames don't need to take on a rental. So if you really wanted to, you could go and acquire Gallagher and try to bring Stone here to play with his brother on July first. Hmm. Exactly. Um, we talked about him earlier, also from Ottawa. TSN's now saying that it's less likely than they thought for him to move, but that's 28-year-old Mike Hoffman. What do you think about them bringing in Hoffman? Yeah, and I like Hoffman. I like Hoffman, but I don't know. There's just there's always been something that just hasn't seemed right when I watch him play. Like it just his game. Like he does know how to score. But the rest of his game, uh, I'm not a huge, huge Hoffman fan overall. If the Flames got him, hey, that'd be great. But I think for the cost versus what other options are available, I think that other directions might be a better fit. Well, that's exactly what I was thinking. I think, again, Hoffman, if he moves, he's he's 28. He's in the prime of his career. It's going to be a costly pickup. Yeah, uh, definitely, and that's why, like a guy like Gallagher, you're the difference between Gallagher and Hoffman or Ga Gallagher and Stone is not a ton, but you're getting the personality and more of a fit for the type of team that the Flames are building than either of those guys, because both Hoffman and Stone are slightly more on the finesse side of things where Gallagher's more like Kachuk, where he will create a little bit of a disturbance after whistles and such. Gallagher and Hoffman are pretty much making the same money, same term, but Gallagher's 25, and I'd rather bring in the younger guy to grow with this team than the guy who's 28. Exactly, and if you look at guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan, they're both 23, 24, so he fits in that same age bracket, so... I think that'd be a good fit, uh, and if it costs a defenseman for Gallagher, that's fine. I think you'd if you gave Brody up for Gallagher, I think you'd be getting something else in a t in addition to Gallagher. But I'd take a pick again. We need some picks. Yeah, but yeah, it's possible. It, we just have to see how things shake out, but. I think that it's imperative that the Flames do something. I got one more name here for you. There's a name that you and I talked about in the post or in the preseason. You were quite um, you were quite set on this guy potentially becoming a Flame at one point, and that's Kyle Ocposo playing for one of the worst teams in the league. He's on a six for six deal. What would you think about the Flames going out and trying to do a deal for Ocposo? Uh, that gives you an instant first line right winger. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I. I think because he's got a six-year deal, you could acquire him at a better cost than a lot of these guys because a lot yeah. of teams don't want to absorb six million in salary. I don't think it would cost that much to bring Ocposo in. No, neither do I. 
but a- he's again, 29. if the cost was right, sure. It, it but the price has to be right, and yeah, I don't know. We there's probably better options available, but I if the the Flames are after the deadline with Ocposo in the lineup, hey, great. So, you know, and I think you could say that. You're saying there's better available. When I look around at bona fide, already proven top-line wingers, I'm not seeing anybody else probably available that's not going to be like a rental or, you know, highly sought after. True. And realistically, the Flames should not be going for anybody who's in that rental bracket or even like one more year after this. Like they should be getting guys that, say like Gallagher or like Ocposo where you can have them for three, four, five years without having to get rid of them. Yeah, I mean, I'd be okay going for a guy like Grabner because he's so cheap. You could re-sign him um, next year for a pretty good price still. Yeah, exactly. Like Grabner, even if he was two and a half, like, okay, sure. Yeah. You know, like it's not a big deal. And those are the kind of deals you make before you make the deal of talk to the guy and see if he's okay with it. Yeah. Oh, of course, because that, that's the important thing. Like, if you have intentions of re-signing them, it's just like the stone trade last year where the Flames kind of knew that they were going to sign him but wanted to see how he'd fit and all that. Two two other names as I'm just looking through the Rangers roster here. You mentioned Matt Zuccarello earlier. He's got a two-year, $4.5 million deal each year left. I like him, but... I'm not sure I want another five foot eight guy in the lineup. Yeah, unless he plays like Gallagher, because Gallagher's only five nine, but there's that feisty edge to him. So Zuccarello doesn't that's... have that edge, though. No. An- I know. Another guy I could see the Flames bring on, and again, I like this guy, um, and I would only bring him if the cost was right. Is Jesper Fast? I think Jesper Fast could be a good guy to put on a line with, um, with. Jankowski and Bennett. I think he's a guy who maybe needs a new start. I think he's got something to him. And he's 26 and on a great contract. Less than $2 million a year for three years. Yeah. What do you think of Jesper Fast? Oh, Fast is decent. Uh, with him, it, they're always, every time I've watched him play, it's like you want more from him. If that, you know, like you think that there's. Uh, more to him than what he actually produces and uh, he's a bit of a frustrating player in that respect but those are also the kind of guys you can often get for cheap true so you know he could be a player that eventually breaks out and has like a a 20 goal season out of nowhere but yeah that if the Flames got him, would I be disappointed? No, of course not. But I think uh, it, with any of the names that we've spoken about, I think that if any of them got added, they'd be like, oh, good. So I guess the big question for me the Flames have to ask themselves is, do they want to address depth scoring or do they want to address top line scoring? Most of these guys we've talked about don't come in as a long-term bona fide top line right winger could you put grabner or gallagher or stone or hoffman on there sure do i think that any of them are next year's starting right winger maybe only hoffman i think if they're looking to by trade acquire that guy i think it ha- and they want him for a playoff run now i think it's got to be Ocposo. yeah and yeah realistically the flames don't necessarily need a first line scoring forward uh, like if they got a legitimate second line guy that'd be fine it because Furland is doing a good job as the first line right he's winger he's doing okay now but it, you don't want a Stanley Cup with Furland as your top line right winger well other teams have had similarly unpedigreed players in prime spots in their lineup and done all right so uh it depth is the thing that matters and like when i look at the second line backland and kachuk work great together but whether it's brower or for leak i'm underwhelmed by the right winger there and if the flames were to get any of the insert a right winger's name here 
and stick them on that line, I think that you've instantaneously got a second first line. And then the third line, you drop for a leak down there. Now you got Bennett with Jankowski and for a leak. That's a good quality third scoring option. And now you're, you've got a well-balanced attack through your top nine. And I think that you could get away with just getting a good second line player you don't necessarily need to go all out and get a star forward it's just that they need uh, somebody else that can take a little bit of pressure off the team yeah i agree with you i think star we have to remember the star players the deadline cost you a lot of money if you look back at anybody who has acquired a star they're crazy i mean they're huge amounts of money to bring those guys in so I think honestly, um, if they're going to bring a guy in, the closest you could get would be Mark Stone. I checked; he's not a UFA, he's an RFA, so you won't be able to sign him as a free agent. But I think Mark Stone would be the closest you could get to a number one winger. But I I think either Stone, Gallagher, or Grabner to me, maybe even Tatar, could be your second line winger and do a good job there. Yeah, and, and realistically, the flame. No, and realistically, the Flames, they have three star forwards already with Kachuk, Gaudreau, and Monaghan. They have three star defensemen. Well, four, technically, if you include Hamannick in that. So they have enough there where those guys should be able to carry the majority of the load. So as long as that they have enough secondary options that are quality players... They should be fine, but they're missing one of those spots right now, and it's throwing everything else out of whack. And I'm also looking ahead here a little bit. I'm looking at the free agent class of this year, just looking at, okay, if they don't make a trade for that right winger, who could they potentially bring in on July 1st? I don't want them to touch Patrick Hornquist. I think he's old and slow. Uh, yeah, well, he's always been slow ever since his NHL debut, but it, he's just the guy that you park in front of the net on the power play and he bangs in the rebounds. But at 4.5, I don't want to touch him. Yeah, yeah he's the modern-day Thomas Holmstrom, yeah. which is useful, but yeah, you can just throw a chuck there and that'd be fine. But looking at some of the right-wingers, we got Grabner, we got Chris Stewart, Drew Stafford, Tommy Wingles. Uh, Jimmy Hayes, Ryan Reeves, JT Brown. Like, there are some options available who wouldn't cost you more than probably a million and a half, two million at the most if you wanted to pick up some of that depth at the at July 1st. So I think the question... Yeah, but the, none of those players are going to fix that top six forward no. spot. So, and that's where the Flames need to address that via well, trade. So I think you trade for a top six right winger to you know this week and then you can bring in a third line right wing option to play with Jankowski and Bennett yeah third fourth offense. line guy yeah I, I wouldn't trade for a fourth line yeah. I think you promote your fourth line mm-hmm. I also think that if somebody as you were mentioning earlier in the back link of Chuck Perry and I think let's say Gallagher or Grabner or Stone comes in there I think for could do some good things with Jankowski and Bennett yeah, same here. So that I mean, the- and then then you have like a a really top, solid top nine, one through nine. So then the Flames forward balance is balanced. Then your defense is balanced. So like the team starts to look like somebody that can actually do something, whereas right now it's not so much. We asked our listeners last week what they thought the Flames should do with the deadline. We're talking about what we're thinking. But interesting poll last week. We had four possible options, and we split the the vote quite a bit. Um, the number one vote was they should look to buy, buy long-term assets. 54% of respondents picked that one. Try to strengthen the roster for a playoff run, potentially with rentals, was 27% of the vote. Do nothing was 18% of the vote. And the season's over, sell and recoup draft picks, got no votes so i think we're mostly all in the same boat here at fireside chat and that we don't want rentals if you're going to bring in a guy who's on his last year but you can you know get that deal done that's one thing but i don't want them to go get like rick nash yeah well 
that's the thing. Like, if they can get rentals, but for, like, depth pieces, like, say you get a fourth line center instead of having Stajan in the lineup. But it, and you but get them for like not, a seventh it's, round it's pick. Not worth it's giving like up a, an asset, I'd say. We got better centers in Stockton. I know, but you know what I mean. Like, if you're just getting filler players, then that's fine for rentals. But you know, like that's the Flames don't really need anything though for depth filler parts because they do have a decent farm system. So. They just need to pull the trigger. Rentals are usually veteran guys, and I think that with Versteeg coming back early March, that almost fills that need right there, is that depth veteran yeah. guy. Because if he's on the fourth line, like if you say like the Flames do get that second line winger, then you have your fourth line as being Versteeg with Stajan slash Lazar and Brower. Like, that's a really good fourth line. So, you know, it... It could be viable. It's just we have to wait and see. So if we're going to give up a roster piece on Monday or before Monday, you think the the name that probably moves is TJ Brody? If I had to guess, yes. But it it depends on the exact trade that you're dealing with. So could you move a Hamilton? Maybe but it would have to be like in something for Carlson or something like that. I don't see you moving Giordano or Hamannick for anything. Yeah, I just so and Stone wouldn't get you anything anyway. So I don't think you can move Hamannick this quickly after you just pay the Kings ransom for him. Yeah. Um, I think they'll move Stone eventually, but I don't think you can move both Brody and Stone in the same season. And that leaves too many holes in the defense. I could see potentially moving Brody, and based on how Raz does, then decide to maybe move Stone at the deadline. Or, sorry, yeah. the draft, I mean. Oh. But I can't, I can't see him shipping both those guys out. That just leaves you way too many holes there. Yep. We've heard some rumors that the Flames might be shopping Gillies. What would you think if, come Tuesday, John Gillies is no longer a Calgary Flame? I'd be disappointed because Gillies is a solid guy and, you know, he's done well in Stockton. But uh, then again, you have to give to get. So it would just depend on what the deal is. Like, if they're just giving him away to give him away, then of course I'd be disappointed. But, you know, if it's a legitimate upgrade, then sure, why not? And it would suck but Riddick has played very well. So, we'll see. And what you said there is important, I think, for everyone to remember over the next week. I say this to Flames fans all the time. You have to give to get. You can't get somebody for nothing. And so, even though we might have a favorite player who might leave, the guy, if we trade a significant piece like a Brody or, you know, somebody like that, you're going to get a significant piece back. So, yeah, we lose out on somebody we like, but we have to hope that piece we get back will be just as good, if not better. Mm-hmm. This team is not in a fire sale mode. This isn't trade Jerome McGinley for a bunch of you know crappy prospects and picks. If the Flames make a move, I think right now it's going to be a hockey move. And I think of all the teams of the deadline, the Flames might be the most well-positioned to make a hockey move. Mm-hmm. Any other names from the Flames organization you think we might see in play? The only player I think that could move is Bro- uh, Brower, but as a throw-in for cap reasons. Sort of like a Carlson and Bobby Ryan-ish type trade, but beyond that, not really. I think if the Flames move Brower, they'd have to absorb some salary. Yeah. Or it would be taking I, on a similarly bad contract. So, yeah, and we'll at see. that point, what's the point? If you're trading bad contract for bad contract, you might as well keep your own bad contract. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I could see the Flames doing is potentially purging some of their older guys in Stockton, like uh, Klimchuk, Shin Carrick, Poirier. If they could move one of those guys, almost like the Max Reinhardt deal, for a third or a fourth. Um, I could see them doing something like that as well, saying, you know what, we've got maybe a guy we don't think has the trajectory to be a Calgary Flame. Um, almost like the when they moved Granlin to 
uh, Vancouver for a pit or for Shin Carrick, either a deal like that for another AHL guy or like the um, the Reinhardt deal just to get a mid round pick. I agree. So that's that's the only other thing I can see. But I think there's going to be some crazy deals this year, and I'm hoping when all said and done, the Flames aren't part of one because I think with the playoffs so tight this year somebody's going to pay way more than they should for one of these players. Like last year with Minnesota and Hansel. Pretty much. If we could if we could convince somebody to pay us that, great. But I just hope we're not the one doing the paying. Yeah. Because I think that really messes up this team long term. Definitely. Um, next thing we'll talk about then, move on from trade deadline. We'll discuss the deadline more next week after it's happened. But let's talk about Michael Backlund. You and I had said that Backlund was probably due a big raise this year when his contract came due. And this got done quicker than I thought it would get done. I thought we'd have to wait till close to the July 1st. But the Flames finally signed up Michael Backlund. They got him inked to a six-year deal worth $5.35 million per year. He has a full no-trade clause for the first three years and a modified no-trade in the last three years. So, Matt, first question for you, looking at term and money. How do you think the Flames did with this deal? I have zero complaints at all. And the term, it's a year longer, but, yeah, not a big deal. How do you think this contract will now affect the Kachuk contract? It really shouldn't. Kachuk's going to get six plus regardless, so... And that was going to be the case either way. So I don't see that. I think Kachuk will end up being the highest paid forward on the team once his contract's up just due to the fact that the cap's gone up. So, yeah, it it is what it is. I I think that the contract for Backlund, it it needed to be done. Uh, Backlund's too important of a player to the team to let him walk. And the price was good. I, I was thinking myself, anything under six is a home run for Calgary. And 5-3-5 five, five is awesome. I don't have any problem with that. It fits in terms of all of the players seem to be taking a little bit of a haircut on the average cap hit in order to get extra years so that way the team can have more depth for a longer time so that way the team can be competitive for a long time so and i don't see defensive players that are intelligent like backland don't fall off the face of the earth in terms of their abilities so like some fans were concerned that oh in like the fourth year and beyond he's just going to basically be matt stajan and it's like uh it, if you look at other Swedish players, they typically don't fall off the face of the earth, like it, it, forwards or defensemen. The the smart. You're saying the Swedish are very durable. Yeah, it's the smarts that it make the difference, uh, and a lot of the Swedish players like Zetterberg, Lidstrom, the Sedins, like they're able to adapt on the fly to their bodies getting slower as time goes on to compensate for that without really seeing a a huge drop off in their game if you look at what this means cap wise you pretty much take what Backlund was making add to it what Versteeg is making I don't think Versteeg will be back and you pretty much have the new contract so at about a million and three quarter raise I think that's a great price to pay for Backlund I I said anything under 5.5 I'd be happy with I think like you said, he took a haircut, but I like to see a guy like Backlund willing to commit here for six years. I mean, Backlund, if he went to July 1st, probably could have got a lot more money on the free agent market. Oh, yeah. So I think it's a test. It's a testament to this organization that he's willing to commit here for yeah, six years. I agree, and I'm thrilled that he's going to be a flame for this long. It gives the Flames three really good centers for a very long time with Monahan, Jankowski, and Backlund. So the Flames don't have to worry about the center ice position for the next half decade. And that's the important thing. And that's the hardest position to fill. So the Flames, as they carry on in future drafts, they can look to supplant 
and restock that position in their prospect ranks and having those guys locked up for that long you don't have to worry about it tomorrow you can like say the 2020 draft you can go and draft the center in the first round and eventually if he makes it well hey that's great but it's not urgent now and the flames have plenty of options so it's good and now we don't have to worry about centers for a very long time i think and we saw this on the defense right is nobody would take more than the captain and we saw Dougie take a bit of a pay cut and Brody. I think we're starting to see the same thing established in the forward ranks where when it comes to, you know, third line guys or it comes to a guy like uh, even Bennett renewing next year, I think now we're starting to get that hierarchy of, you know what, you're not more important than Backlund, so now we have that ceiling of what we can pay you. Yeah, and I think that the Flames have done a good job to keep, the important pieces for a long term and you know like Gaudreau and Monaghan and Backlund keeping them for a long term so that way you don't have to worry about those positions on the ice and you can hope to fill those other positions via either free agency internally or trades so they're all good value contracts for the dollars they're getting paid and depth is the thing that tends to matter in terms of cup contenders so if you can have all these very high skill players locked up for cheap you don't have like the blackhawks and syndrome where they get so many high priced guys that they're having to jettison half of their team and then fall apart And one thing we have to look ahead to as well, probably in 2021, is another potential expansion draft and what those might mean for that. So, again, I think Backlund is a guy you'd want to keep anyways. So even on a modified no move, you'd be fine with that. Thankfully, that year, if that is the year that Seattle comes in, Froelich and Brower both come off the books. So that would give the Flames a lot more flexibility. Just know before we start wrapping up, Mike Smith's still out of lineup. He is apparently on the road trip with the team to California this week, but he's not expected to play. Um, So Riddick will be keeping the net warm for Smith. I'm hearing probably not coming back until at least after the Colorado game on the weekend. I think Riddick is really, this is his chance to prove himself. He's looked good as a backup, but seeing how he can perform, you know, three, four, five games in a row, I think that's really the test of if this guy's for real or not. I agree. Especially when you have older starters, they tend to need more relief, and we weren't sure how long Smith could play. So I think if the team can be, can say to a guy like Riddick next year, okay, you know what, we now know you can do this two, three, four games in a row. Now they know how much they can actually rest Smith. Well, Matt, let's look ahead to this week's poll. As always, we ask our fans a question and get you guys to sound off and let us know what you think. We talked about Michael Backlund's contract, but we want to know what you guys think. Is it a good deal? Is it not a good deal? Should Backlund not have been re-signed? You let us know. This poll will be available on our website at firesidechat.ca, right on the homepage. You can also see it on our Facebook page. We'll pin it to the top. On Facebook, we're Fire, Fireside Chat, so we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat, and we'll also pin it to the top of our Twitter, and you can find that at twitter.com slash Fireside Podcast. So if you want to vote, let us know what you think about the backend deal, and we will read the results next week. Matt, as we look at the week that's coming up, the Flames have three games. They have a road trip through Vegas and Arizona, then they come back and play Colorado on a matinee game. This week is a first for the Calgary Flames. We've heard about the dad's trip in the past. This week, they say it's coincidental, but all of the boys' moms are on the trip this week, and I can't be thinking it's coincidental when they're all going to Vegas and they want them to behave. So let's bring everyone's mom. Yeah, get the people that are qualified to get hit with the purse. (laughs) Boys behave. Who Who do you think gets in more trouble, the moms or the boys? Probably the moms. <laughs> you wonder if you might see Gully getting hit with his mom's first. You do a better job coaching there, young man. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it'll be interesting to see if we see anything from the moms. Usually there's a montage from the dad's trip, and I think the mom's idea is kind of a neat one. I guess this is something that Gully did when he was in Vancouver, and that's where he got the idea. Can't think that this is all coincidental, though. They're going to Vegas, the place you can get in the most trouble, and let's bring everyone's mom along. Yeah. Not a bad idea. 
Um, so we've got well, three realistically, games with the six points on the board. Yeah, the six points on the board. The Flames need at least four, and hopefully six. So what do you think they do? Uh, probably drop Vegas and win the other two. You think they'll drop Vegas, beat Arizona, beat Colorado? Yeah. Do you think that we see John Gillies in that in any of these? Probably the Arizona game. Yeah, I think Arizona, you'll see Gillies get the start. I'm not confident enough in Riddick to play back-to-back at this point. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to go the same as you. I think they'll probably struggle in Vegas. I think Arizona, if they don't beat Arizona, we've got other issues. That's also a road game where we do very well. And then I'm hoping they need that win against Colorado at the Dome. They don't do well in matinees, but I think that could get them back on on track to feel more confident coming into March. Well, Matt, that's about it for this week. We do want to make an announcement for next week. Um, We're going to have some special going on. Next Monday is trade deadline day in the NHL, as we all know. Matt and I are going to do something we've never done before. We're going to do a video show. But the video is only going to be available for those that tune in live. So next Monday on the 26th at 7.30 p.m., We'll be going live. We'll have all the details of where we're going to go live and how you can watch us on our website at firesidechat.ca. Um, but the video will be there for those that go live and for everyone that's not live. We'll still have the regular audio show in the feed later in the week. So if you want to see us, if you want to interact, there will be some chances for you guys to talk to us, ask us questions. Tune in at 730. And like I said, go to firesidechat.ca in advance to figure out where we're going to be, how you tune in, all those things. I'm looking forward to it. It should be fun. Yeah, it'll be a new adventure for us, and you actually get to put a face to the names and the voices that you hear. So, that's always good, too. Although it's, you know, we may end up breaking the cameras, so, you know. (laughs) You know when you see those old court shows, and they've got the guy with, like, the obscured voice and the face? Yeah. Because they're state's witness, people are going to realize that's not us? Maybe we'll wear a plastic bag or a paper bag on our heads. So nobody knows who we are. All right, Matt. Well, you have a good week. Enjoy this road trip and enjoy whatever happens at the deadline. And I will talk to you on deadline day after trading's done for the day. Thanks. And have a good week, everybody. Thanks for listening. And go Flames Go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.